All right. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Grow Up with Grow show. I'm Brett Sklar, your cruise director and managing partner here at Grow Powerful. And just a reminder about this show, or if this is your first time, we know that there's a lot of marketing podcasts and videos and shows that are out there, and that's awesome. This is kind of one of those, but kind of not one of those. We really want to help give growth, marketing, uh, revenue and strategy ideas to the CEOs that are out there that are trying to figure out their marketing mix or their sales and marketing mix or their go-to-market strategy. And so from time to time, we bring amazing people in to talk to you, the CEO, to talk to you, the chief revenue officer, to talk to you, the investor, whether it's a PE or a venture capital firm. Uh, but we just really want to have some fun and and really talk about marketing outside of the inner marketing realm and to help CEOs and help those leaders. So now let's dive into the show. And today, not only do we have a great topic, but we actually have a great expert who's coming in with us. Our show topic for today is overcoming obstacles to get to that next growth milestone. And our guest person on here with us, who also happens to be one of the best ICMOs we've got on staff, is Rhonda Geet. Rhonda, before you say hello, let me brag about you for just a moment. Now, you're a marketing executive and you've got over 20 years of experience and that's fine. You started when you were five. Uh, <laughs> you've got a, you know, a lot of success in helping at least two companies to get to that acquisition phase, which we're all hungry for, uh, and acquired by multinational companies, which is pretty awesome because when you're talking about acquisitions, you want people to acquire you that have the money. Uh, and so I'm sure you did a lot of work there to find that product market fit. Um, you even helped a B2B SaaS company, which is really important for this audience, to get to an IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. That's impressive. Uh, but wait, there's more. You've obviously got some great experience with early stage companies, all the way up to Fortune 150. So you've seen really both sides of the growth momentum, growth phase um, you know, perspective. And you've got that experience with the SaaS, manufacturing, healthcare. And I know healthcare has been a really big area for us lately. Um, connected devices and much more. Uh, so with that, you know, I'll shut up and I'll let you introduce yourself, Rhonda Geet, to the world of the Grow Up With Grow show. Well, thank you, Brett, for having me. You make me sound wonderful. And thank you for knowing that I started at age five. Um, and uh, I do, I do love marketing and I love working with a variety of different companies and all different sizes and really helping companies accelerate their growth to get to their next milestone. And I am excited to be part of Grow Powerful. Nice. Awesome. Well, and we're very excited and very lucky to have you on board. It, it seems like, um, and this is bragging about grow the company for a minute. We've really done a great job of of finding amazing talent and yourself uh, and the people that were a part of the original crew and the most recent cohort of of interim or fractional CMOs. It's really um, speaks a lot to the growth of the fractional marketing leadership industry in B two B, but also the fact that and it's something that I've been writing about some of the best B2B marketing leaders that really have the proven track record don't want to go work full-time for a company again. Uh, they'd rather do fractional or interim work, interim work and really help people out. So we're lucky to have you here. Uh, we're lucky to have you as a part of Grow. Um, but I got to ask, um, what is your superpower when it comes to marketing or growth um, that you have that's really helped you, you know, leap tall uh, acquisitions in a single bound. <laughs> yeah, I think my superpower is bringing a fresh perspective to companies who are trying to get to the next growth milestone. Every company, regardless of their size, has a milestone that they're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for companies to get outside of their industry. They're very focused on industry trends, what's going on with competitors. And sometimes a fresh perspective can give that spark of growth that uh, they have been missing or that they're struggling with. And an example of that is 
I was in the video games industry and then transitioned over to the B2B side of things. And in the video games, the world, you use gamif gamification to mm -hmm. help make a game stickier, to get users to use the game more and play the game more. Uh, with B2B products, you started seeing that kind of integrate itself into products. Asana is a great example of that. And I think, you know, marketing fundamentals are, are the same across industry, but just having that outside perspective and a different perspective to bring to a company, I think is my superpower. Nice. Nice. And, and yeah, that gamification, um, it's funny. That's sort of, I feel like led into one of the key tenets of product led growth. Uh, and so I can see where your gaming industry experience where gamification and gaming are, are much more synonymous leads to the gamification of how to adopt new users, new buyers and things like that. So I didn't think about that before you mentioned it, but um, I can definitely see where that's a superpower of yours uh, in today's world of product led growth of community led growth of you know people bringing other people along the journey to win you know customers to win communities and win ultimately business that's very cool so we're living in a world so speaking of games you know it, it feels like 2023 in the business technology world is like an episode of uh the last of us Right, <laughs> which I know is like a really popular show right now. Love it's, that show right now. <laughs> it, it's kind of a zombie show, but it really is more about the human condition and 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 you know how that works. Uh, but 2023 kind of feels like that in certain ways, where every week or every month is a different episode that is a completely different experience, and it really is about survival. And so. You know, I asked this question to you uh, with, with 2023 being this weird world we live in, especially in B2B technology, what have you seen to be a winning formula for marketing leadership in 2023? That's a great question. 2023 is, is this crazy whirlwind of who knows what's going to happen. It's a little less crazy than 2020, but yeah. it's not back to normal in any way, shape, or form. And I think a formula that is successful for marketing leadership is to tie it into all aspects of the business. So don't think of marketing just in marketing terms, but what are the business objectives? And, you know, you need to do that in any economic climate, I mean, mm -hmm. to be successful. But sometimes when things are going really well, that can kind of fall to the wayside. And yep. with 2023 being, um, you know, starting off kind of conservative and companies wanting to see that their programs and what they're investing in is really moving the needle and tightening budgets and having to prove everything out over and over and over, not just, yes, we want to do this, but this is, is working is it working fast enough? Is it working efficient enough? Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes it's it's easy for marketing to say when you're at the table with the other executives, like, oh, we need more budget because if we get more budget, we can get more pipeline and, and fill the top of the funnel. But if you're looking at the overall business objectives, sometimes marketing needs to take a step back and say, you know what, we need to take a portion of the budget and put towards this great product opportunity that just came up for an right. example. And if we do this, we can gain more market share and we can accelerate into a new ICP. And really taking that step back and looking at what's best for the business instead of what's best for marketing is something that I think will be the winning formula for marketing and businesses in 2023. So if we talk about like recent learning, so that's obviously, you know, what the world could look like for 2023. I love the example you gave of, you know, it's not about marketing, it's about overall growth. And, and I think that's sort of a key point of this show and, and, and the show in general is, it's not about marketing and not about marketing tactics. It's about growth and it's looking at the bigger picture. So your example of maybe there's a new 
you know, ICP or ideal client profile uh, of, of this, you know, untapped market that's over here. And with a few minor modifications to a product or a few minor modifications to landing pages uh, or, you know, different email lists to go after, there's a new market opportunity over there that we haven't tapped into. And it requires some product uh, focus. And so, and I, I truly feel like the idea of a fractional or interim CMO plays really well for CEOs there because it's not the ego. It's not the protection of the budget. It's not the, well, I didn't think about it over here in my shop and somebody else is going to get that money. And so therefore there's that, that pissing match of budget with a fractional or interim CMO. There's not that ego driving a budget or the, the protection that's driving a budget. And so I love that example. So let me ask you another question. And it might be, um, answered in a similar way to answering the, the sort of winning formula in 2023, think about something you've just learned. And so something you've just recently learned or something you've just recently done that's been um, uh, an incredibly effective marketing strategy um, that is different or new that you've learned just recently. Well, I love learning new things, new technology new trends that are coming out. I, I love reading about them and learning how they can help. But I view marketing strategy as an extension of business objectives. Therefore, when I'm developing a marketing strategy, it's dependent on what each individual company is trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. What works for one company may not work for another, even if they're in the same industry. When I was working full-time in-house, I was often recruited in, within the industry from one competitor to another to say, do for me what you did for them. And even though they were in the same industry and they had similar products, their ICP was slightly different. And mm -hmm. it took a lot of education to explain that you can't just rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. However, marketing playbooks and marketing strategy that has worked um, over time shouldn't just be thrown out just because there's a new trend. There um, is this nuance of understanding each individual business and what their needs are, and then developing a customized marketing strategy that's going to help them reach their next growth milestone. Now, there are lots of great tactics out there that can help make things more efficient and effective. Um, those are always fun to try and learn and can help teams produce even more uh, content, for example, or to be more uh, um, efficient, like with email automation. Um, but as far as marketing strategy, I really tie that back to individual business objectives. Got it. Got it. Okay. So then, uh, you know, Rhonda, let's, let's go, let's, let's sort of step out and go back to our main topic at hand here, which is overcoming obstacles to get to the next to the next growth milestone and everybody that's listening to this and everybody that's going to watch the blogs or, or read the blog summary or or listen to this or whatever it is wanting to hear what's the magic what's the secret sauce to get from you know step one to step two or to get from series a to series b and to get from revenue of you know x million to double x million so um, but let's start and talk about those obstacles, because to overcome obstacles, we have to understand the obstacles. As G.I. Joe says, knowing is half the battle. What are some of the obstacles that you've seen companies face? And, and maybe we look at it at different stages or different phases of a company's development. Over my career, I've seen three main themes. And this holds true today, even when I started years ago. And surprisingly, these three themes are not exclusive to early stage companies or Fortune 150 companies. It's to every company in between. And the three main themes that I think companies face are one, what got you here won't get you there two, growing pains, and three, prioritization. I think it, you can lump a lot of things into each of those buckets um, with what got you here won't get you there. 
you know, talking about whether you're trying to get your next round of funding or you're trying to get from 5 million ARR to 10 million ARR or 20 million ARR, you hit, like companies hit these walls and these obstacles. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for executives and even employees to go, oh, wait, we need to shift our focus because they're like, well, you know, all of these customers got us to this point. They're going to get us to the next point. And sometimes that's, that's hard to see. Um, so those are the three main buckets that I see as obstacles for companies. Gotcha. And um, so it's what got you here won't get you there. Growing pains and then prioritization. Is that what the third one was? Correct. Okay. Um, I love that list. Um, and, and I think we can, uh, we can probably learn a lot in future content, um, uh, you know, about those three things. So diving into each of these, you know, starting with the first one of what got you here, won't get you there. Um, I'd love to hear some stories about, um, how that's become a stumbling block or an obstacle. And then also how have people overcome, you know, again, the topic is overcoming the obstacles. So how have they overcome those obstacles? Yeah. One of the things on what gets you here, won't get you there is kind of what I just talk, uh, talked about um, customers and ICP changes. Mm -hmm. When you are a new company in your early stage company, for example, you are trying to get that product market fit. You're getting customers to help get you to, let's say 10 million AR and you're super excited that you finally got there. And then usually companies plateau and, you know, they try different messaging, different graphics, different content, but kind of sit at that 10 million AR. And sometimes what a company may need to do is shift their ICP. And that's really hard to to kind of wrap your head around of like, all of these customers got us to 10 million ARR. Why are we abandoning them? And I'm Mm -hmm. not saying to abandon them. I'm just saying that sometimes the ICP changes and shifts. And it makes sense when you think about it as in terms of the product. As a product grows and evolves and expands and changes, The initial product that you had that fit that initial ICP made sense. But as your product evolved, sometimes the ICP doesn't evolve and you need to evolve your ICP because your product has um, evolved. And once you kind of wrap your head around that and realize that, yes, you may lose some of those early customers, but you're going to gain a whole new bucket of ICP customers to go after. Um, it's a little easier to understand. You know, I see a great example of that um, in Salesforce, right? Salesforce.com. Uh, they started out being the underdog going after small businesses or more importantly, small groups within large businesses that were frustrated with the traditional CRM, you know, uh, model, uh, whether it was, you know, stuck on a server somewhere, right? So software-based uh, or localized, or it was that any changes that needed to take place took, you know, weeks or months. And then here comes, you know, uh, salesforce.com, you know, remember the no software logo. And and they basically said, look, you can you can spin this up in 10 minutes and you can get it productive in 15 minutes and you can start using it right away. And that got them to an amazing, amazing starting point. Fast forward, uh, and they are a true enterprise application. Yes. And they're, you know, what got them to their first stage definitely did not get them to where they are today. And you know, it's frustrating because they've kind of abandoned the little people that and the little groups that got in there. But from an investor standpoint, from a growth standpoint, from a you know, uh, a focus on, you know, the, the, the ultimate outcome and the enterprise selling, um, you know, they definitely knocked it out of the park and they followed your, you know, step one of what got you here, won't get you there to a T. That's a great example. It's a, a true example because they really grab market share by servicing the, the customers that felt yeah. 
kind of out on an island all by themselves. Yep. Uh, and and if we're going to get on the, the therapy uh, couch here and have a talk, then I need to, to have a therapy session because I kind of feel the same thing is happening. Uh, and just in full transparency, you know, we use HubSpot and I've loved HubSpot. Uh, they, HubSpot loves HubSpot so much that um, they want me to love it so much more that it's a significantly larger per- percentage of my of my costs. And so I'm actually looking at who's the next, you know, what got you here won't get you there uh, that I think is maybe more innovative, uh, maybe more cost aligned and maybe I'm cheap, but maybe I'm not. Um, and and a lot of the things that HubSpot has promised, uh, I haven't necessarily seen come to fruition. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at alternatives, but um, now that, okay, so, you know, off the soapbox, off of the therapy <laughs> couch, um, I do think that the companies that really thrive are the ones that don't get stuck in the rear view mirror and look at the, at the, you know, look out ahead of them. So that's, that's a great one. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we've obviously beat that one to a dead horse. Uh, and so thank you for that. You know, the next one you mentioned was growing pains and um, you know, I think about when I think about growing pains and I think about startups, I think about um, there's a visual that basically says, you know, a startup's journey, you think it's like, you know, zoop, uh, but in reality, it's like, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, all of this. And, and when we help our clients and we get them to a successful exit, you know, there's a joke that's like, well, that was an overnight success that took 10 years to get there. Or that was an overnight <laughs> success that took 15 years to get there. So talk to me about the growing pains and, and what people go through and are there unique things in the smaller growing pains versus the big company growing pains? Yes, growing pains, some of the things that I've seen have nothing to do with the business side of things. It has a lot to do with employees, especially early stage employees that were there from the very beginning or maybe came on when they were at 100 people and now they're they're growing to you know 500 people. Um, as, as the revenue grows and, and I think it's hard for customers too. So you were talking about HubSpot, you know, uh, customers are like, wait, why are you leaving me? You, you helped me so much. I think employees have that same thought of like, wait, I used to be in charge of 20 different things. And now you want me to be in charge of two. Uh, and I think if companies can explain to employees why things are shifting and over communicate of, yes, when we were smaller, we needed you to uh, wear multiple hats. But now as we grow, if each person focuses in and is laser focused on their area, we can grow more rapidly. Going back to, for example, that product opportunity uh, with budgets, if you see a product opportunity and you have your your product team focused on 20 different things, you're not going to grow that product as quickly as if they were focused on a couple of different things. Yep. And I think that's hard for employees, especially in today's day and age where you see LinkedIn posting these companies laid off thousands of employees, X percentage of employees, employees want to show value and that they're um, bringing value to the company so that if the company has to go through layoffs, that they're not laid off. And sometimes they feel taking away that responsibility yeah. is really hard. In larger size companies, you kind of feel the same way. Um, you know, I, I worked for a Fortune 100 and 50 company and it um it would shift and innovate on a regular basis which i thought was amazing for a a large you know 30 plus billion dollar company to really take the time to go you know what we're seeing the market shift we need to shift our divisions and our structure and that is really hard for companies um to explain to employees of like, yes, we said six months ago, this is what you're focused on, but now we're changing because we're seeing the shift. Yeah. Um, but again, it comes down to communication and explaining this is why we're we're shifting and what we're focused on. And it's contributing back to those business objectives that we've been talking about this entire time. 
And this will help be make us successful and help us reach our goals. And I really think communicating that and not trying to hide like, oh, we're doing this, but you don't need to know why, just do it, um, is what makes companies successful, regardless of their size. So I love what you're talking about here. And, and we're talking about growing pains and we think about growth. Obviously, when we're thinking about you know, growing a business, we think about the numbers, the revenue, the number of customers, the average revenue per customer, the ARR, uh, you know, how many markets are we going after? How many products, cross-sell, upsell, all those things. But the reality is growth needs to pivot from an external focus at the CEO level to an internal focus at the CEO level at moments of change, as at, at moments of new things happening. And it's, it's, Organizational behavior 101. It's it's organization design. It's organizational. What what was it called before? Industrial psychology. It's the idea that before any changes can happen with the outside world, these changes and this growth needs to happen inside the company. And so I love that idea of really going back and forth as a CEO. You focus on the outside growth only after you've got the inside you know, growth of humans, growth of new process, growth of new assignments figured out, then you deploy it out to the world. And so it's that outside, then inside, then outside. I, I, uh, something very cool that I love about that. And it's not just about, you know, uh, the revenue side of things. Um, so then the third thing you talked about is something that I think we all think we're good at and we absolutely are not good at and that is prioritization. And, and again, going back to the, the therapy couch here, we're working on building out our own prioritization model called EOS or Entrepreneur Operating System. And it's, a, uh, it's based on a book called Traction by a person named Gina Wickman. And uh, the reason why we're doing it is because we've seen a lot of our early stage clients that are getting to the next stages uh, are using this model. And it's because it forces prioritization, not just in a CEO's head, not just in an executive team's meetings, but across the entire company. So talk to me about the fact that, you know, is it is it an early stage company problem? Because I, I'm bringing that early stage lens to it. Or is it something you're seeing as a problem and an opportunity and an obstacle to overcome with larger companies as well. Yes. I did a survey on this on LinkedIn, on my LinkedIn page, asking some things that executives were struggling with and prioritization came out as number one, like first really? and foremost. And it's interesting because it's not all you know, like early stage companies that are focused on it. And then once you get to a certain revenue level, you've got it all figured out. Every size company faces this obstacle. And we even face it as individuals. If you think of our lives of balancing work and life and friends and family and everything together, it's hard to prioritize. And I think there, you know, EOS is a great example of ways to force people to prioritize. There's um, OKRs. There's lots of different mm -hmm. ways that companies can use tools to prioritize. Um, and it's hard, especially when you're you're trying to get to that next growth milestone to put a stake in the ground and say, hey, we're going to go for these three priorities and the shiny objects that come up that might sound good, we're, we're going to still stick to these. Now, of course, there's always times when you need to pivot and adjust. Um, I think Apple and Steve Jobs uh, showed that over and over. You know, they're like, we're a computer company. And then, no, we're a, a music company. And no, we're an, a phone company. But they're actually all of those. Yep. Um, and, you know, taking that, that, stick and putting it in the ground and going, okay, we're going to go for this is really hard and really scary for a lot of people. 
And especially when budgets start tighten, uh, tightening up and sales cycles get longer, it's really easy to go, wait, no, we need to explore more things because we don't know if this is going to work. And we might be putting all of our chips in on this one thing. And what if it doesn't pan out? Yeah. So yeah. that's just, that's human nature, but you have to kind of go back in history. I'm a big um, proponent of learning from other people's mistakes and not repeating them. And if you look at past crazy economic times, the companies that were really focused and doubled down and said, we're going to do this and we're going to stay on this path. Those are the companies that were successful, that grabbed market share when their competitors tightened up and said, nope, we're just going to stay the course and not do anything different. Um, the companies that took that stand were the ones that were really successful. And they balanced the need um, to have that brand awareness to help build longer term pipeline, because just because some companies are really focused and, you know, moving ahead in a very cautious, optimi optimistic way. Other companies are taking a little longer to purchase new technology, uh, but you need that brand awareness, that longer term pipeline to stay top of mind. And those companies that are maybe dragging their feet a little more. However, keep going. However, you still need the short-term programs to get yeah. quick sales and convert those, those wins and, and convert your funnel faster. So you have to balance that. And um, it's hard in, in good times to make priorities, you know, stick and, and stay with them. It's even harder when you're facing some uncertainties and the revenue just isn't coming as quickly as you would like it. So you mentioned something that I hadn't really thought about uh, when it comes to this topic, but you kind of did this juxtaposition of mm, focus versus staying the course. Uh, and and talk to me about the difference between those two, because some people might synonymize being focused, and sorry, I'm losing my voice here, staying focused with staying the course. How are those two different things? Yes. Staying focused is going back to those business objectives. It, a lot of companies are like, oh, it's really easy to come up with my business objectives. I want to make this much revenue and I want to do this and grab this much market share. But the companies that really push and poke and prod on their business the objectives and really go through the hard lesson of, of coming up with those strategies and putting them to the test. When you have that focus uh, and you've gone through those stages of developing your company, it helps you stay focused. And those business objectives, if done well, help guide you when things get foggy. I live in the Bay Area, so you know we deal with fog. So when you have those um those foggy times that you're trying to get through, having that focus and that that North Star to go after really helps keep you on your way. However, staying the course, like you said, some companies may be, okay, I made this SaaS product for this particular company. For example, I'm working with one company that um, they started out as uh, helping tutor in different languages. And they built a platform for their tutoring services. They found that a lot of small businesses love their platform to basically use it as a CRM and payment process and email platform and notification platform. Mm -hmm. And they came upon this new market that they weren't even planning on on going after. And by having business objectives that were, were great for the business, but not just tied to 
translation services or learning new languages or tutorial services. They were able to add this offering on and create another revenue stream for them. Interesting. Interesting. So one of the things that I've learned about you, Rhonda, is that one of the gifts you bring is this experience across a lot of different industries. Uh, we talked about gaming at the beginning of the show. We talked about how that parlays into uh, better ideas and better innovation when it comes to B2B uh, technology. Um, having that purview across a lot of different things, you know, how do you feel companies benefit by having somebody like yourself that comes from outside of an industry or has that bigger, broader industry mix um, you know, to help out in an executive position? In my experience, getting a fresh perspective can spark growth in a company. But I also understand that CEOs and other executives may be a little like, oh, you don't know our industry. You don't know the nuances of it. Mm -hmm. And working with multiple industries, I get that. There are nuances to every industry. When I started in gaming, I didn't know anything. I'm not a gamer. Um, but I love learning. So I threw myself into the gaming world and learned everything that I could. And I did that on my own. I didn't do it on like company time and said, oh, I'm, I'm getting paid to learn. I just love learning about new things. Mm -hmm. When I went into manufacturing, same thing. And then in manufacturing, you learn, oh, you're, you're servicing 40 different industries and need to market to 40 different ICPs based on what you're offering. So you have to learn those industries as well. And I think if, if companies are like, no, we need someone from the industry, you kind of get into that, that little bubble of the industry and sometimes don't, don't see an opportunity that's right in front of you. Um, I also know that sometimes companies have taken the risk and brought someone in and, you know, they don't get up to speed as quick as they like, and they miss some of the nuances of the industry. So I think it's really finding someone that loves bringing a fresh perspective. Yep. You know, there's this, um, this old article that, um, a friend of mine just reminded me of on a call a couple of weeks ago of, um, I'm a big sports fan of, of all kinds of sports and um, the America's Cup sailing, racing, you know, they, one of the teams brought on a, an advisor, a consultant from outside the industry. He was from the cyclist world, a bicycle. Okay. okay. And he came on and, you know, was getting to know this team and was like, why are you using your hands to <laughs> to use this and to to move this boat forward why wouldn't you use your legs when they're stronger and then that frees your hands up for other things and it was it it's the same you know wheel cycle movement right just a hey this is right in front of you and you you don't see it because you're so in tuned with your industry right and right and yeah yeah sometimes those little shifts in perspective can give you the edge that you need to break through that, yeah. that plateau that you're at. And that, what a great perspective and what a great example of, you know, bringing a cyclist into the sailing world and showing that uh, when you're trying to spin things really fast and your legs are four times stronger than your arms, unless you're, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, that, <laughs> you know, that it, it, you know, it can work out really well. Um, I, I love that example. Uh, and it also goes to show that, companies aren't alone. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why people bring us, you know, and I'm talking um, as, as Grow Powerful, you know, bring us in is to get that outside perspective. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of time understanding industries, but I spend a lot of time finding more personality match uh, with a CEO or executive team than other things when helping identify who the right ICMO is with an opportunity or where their stage at at their company is or what kind of insights they're looking to gain 
because it's not just about doing the marketing motions. It's about bringing fresh perspective and fresh examples. And I love that cycling example with, uh, to a sailing team. And I'm going to probably use that a uh, hundred times. So I'll, I'll, I'll hit you up for that article and we'll put it in the comments That's here. Cause I think that's a great, um, a great thing. Well, I know we're, we're up on our time here and I know we, we sort of gone uh, a little bit deeper, which I love. And I hope that uh, everybody here loves it as well. Um, that's really the show of us talking about, you know, uh, overcoming obstacles and how do we get to the next growth milestone? Rhonda, Rhonda, thank you so much for being a part of this show. Where can people find you? People can find me on LinkedIn. I pretty much live on it day and night because I do it for my day job, but I also do it for a volunteer group that I'm part of. Um, so look me up on LinkedIn. Perfect. All right. Well, if you like the show, be sure to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to it. Visit us at growpowerful.io and subscribe to our blog. Subscribe to our newsletter on LinkedIn. Search for us on YouTube. Anywhere, everywhere you are, we could be there too. This show is brought to you by Grow Powerful. Grow is a team of battle-tested and proven fractional CMOs for the innovation economy. We've assembled some of the greatest growth minds in all of B2B technology and deliver them as a team of incredibly capable and proven ICMOs. Thank you again, Rhonda, and thank you everyone for such an amazing show. Have a great day.